Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And we now move on to the next item of business. And uh, before doing so, can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus. The next item of business is a debate on Motion 1769 in the name of Michael Matheson on Global Ambitions for COP26. And I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson to speak to and to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to be able to debate the imminent COP26 summit in Glasgow and to outline the Scottish Government's plans and ambitions for what is a historical event. I assure members that a key priority for this administration is the successful delivery of COP26, along with their net zero and climate commitments in the years beyond the event itself. COP26 is our best and indeed possibly our last chance to deliver the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement, to match the signs and respond to the climate emergency that we see all around us. To achieve our global goals, delegates must arrive with enhanced nationally determining contributions that keep the prospects of 1.5 centigrade alive. However, uh, the First Minister spoke plainly on Monday that their pledges must be backed by action, and not just from the point of view of keeping 1.5 alive. The issues of fairness and justice are at the heart of the climate crisis, and we have a responsibility to take decisive, meaningful action to support all of us. We are really proud of the significant progress Scotland has made in decarbonising our economy, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 by 51.5% on the 1990 levels, whilst increasing economic growth in Scotland. Indeed, the UK's independent statutory adviser, the Committee on Climate Change, commended us on decarbonising faster than any other G20 country since 2008. And our updated climate change plan provides a clear and credible pathway to continuing this trend to beyond 2032. Last year, the equivalent of 96% of gross electricity consumption came from renewable sources. And by the end of this year, we will have allocated £1 billion since 2019 to tackle fuel poverty and improve energy efficiency. This is underpinned by the Scottish Government issuing consents for almost one gigawatt of renewable energy in the last two years alone. And over this Parliament, we are investing at least £1.8 billion to decarbonise homes and building heating, uh, which uh, will both reduce emissions whilst creating green jobs. We are also building on £1.7 billion for sustainable public transport in this uh, financial year and have introduced legislation for free bus travel for those aged under 22. I will give way to Mr Kerr. Liam Kerr. Grateful. I think the cost of the heat in buildings uh, strategy is about £33 billion. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has just talked about putting in £1.8 billion. So where is the balance going to come from and from whom? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, a member will recognise it is a very ambitious target, but funding of this will come from a number of sources, part public sector, part private sector, and also changes in the way in which we deliver uh, heat in individuals' uh, buildings, in the way in which we set out by my colleague Patrick Harvey during the course of his statement. Officer, well, Scotland, of course, can point to the successes that we have made. This government has prioritised the climate emergency and introduced a rigorous legislative framework that underpins our climate emissions journey. After all, a crisis of this scale warrants a collective, unified political response. And the Scottish Parliament has, rightly so, set highly ambitious, legally binding annual targets of 75% by 2030 and net zero by 2045 to reduce emissions, uh, all of which are to be met without a reliance on offsetting credits. Scotland's ambitious and global leadership goes beyond 
what the IPCC report says is required to deliver the aims of the Paris Agreement, as set out in our own indicative nationally determined contribution for COP26. And whilst, of course, I'm proud of the progress so far, I have absolutely no doubt that our aim to decarbonise emissions through a just transition in the next 10 years will be challenging. In line with the requirements of, the Scotland, of Scotland's climate change legislation, we have today laid in Parliament an emissions reduction catch-up report, which sets out the additional emissions reductions required to make up the annual target missed in 2019. The policies and the proposals included in this report will supplement our ambitious and transformational commitments in the updated climate change plan and advances and strengthens Scotland's emission reduction pathway laid out to 2032. We are proud of both Scotland's world-leading targets and that we take, and take on accountability for any missed annual goals in this way, ensuring that the promises we make are underpinned by urgent and ambitious action. I will give way to the member. Michael Mara. I appreciate the minister giving way. Um, he speaks of a collective, unified political response. Uh, can I ask the minister how many times he personally has met with the UK government in support of the ACORN project for the carbon capture in Aberdeenshire? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in the course of probably the last month alone, I would say probably at least two, if not three occasions, where I have raised the matter uh, specifically with them um, on this issue. Uh, turning now to uh, COP itself, we are delivering an ambitious programme of events that will support the global objectives of COP26, advance our climate agenda, strengthen collaboration and showcase uh, Scottish activity. As the First Minister said earlier this week, uh, climate loss and damage is suffered already by communities around the world due to drought, floods, desertification, loss of life and population displacement. Scotland is therefore committed to doubling our Climate Justice Fund over the next four years, leading the way even as a small nation on this issue. We make the best use of our international role, our networks and our influence to achieve global change, including launching the Net Zero Future Initiative, Futures Initiative with the Climate Group and Bloomberg to galvanise state and regional governments. Our aim is to act as a bridge uh, between those outside the formal negotiations and those inside the room. And true to our responsibilities as hosts, we will look to amplify a diversity of voices from less heard nations and people. We are working alongside children and young people, those who face the greatest impact of the climate crisis, so that they have meaningful opportunities to participate and can powerfully advocate for their future. We want children and young people, regardless of background and location, to have the opportunity to act as climate ambassadors with peers in their communities and on a global stage. That is why we are providing opportunities for children and young people from Scotland and across the world to work together on climate action to support the Conference of Youth. We have launched a series of initiatives to engage wider communities across Scotland, empowering them to take action, whilst we support the international implementation of global citizens' assemblies as a means to ensure the views of people worldwide are heard. We have worked in solidarity alongside our colleagues in the Global South, ensuring their voices are heard and that they can participate in shaping the ambition of COP26 through initiatives including the Glasgow Climate Dialogue, the Women's Environment Development Organisation and the Malawi Climate Leaders. And we have created multiple opportunities for Scotland at COP26 to showcase and raise the profile of our renewable energy sector and our transportation sector's decarbonisation, positioning Scotland at the vanguard of action internationally and as an auxiliator for system change. We are working in partnership with Scottish businesses to accelerate their journey towards net zero and to support a just transition, enabling them to adapt and leverage new, fairer and greener opportunities for all. In this way, we will lay the groundwork for more easier uh, ways in which to get to net zero and to create climate resilience in our economy by 2045, whilst at the same time 
retaining a focus on tackling inequality and injustice in our country. I'm proud of Scotland's world-leading targets and the responsibility and accountability that we are taking. We wish to ensure that the promises we make are underpinned by urgent and ambitious action, even if the terms of the devolution settlement do not allow us to access fully many of the levers of control that decarbonisation requires. Absolutely fundamental to action on emissions reductions will be for the UK Government to match Scotland's level of ambition and act with us in areas such as electricity policy and regulation and rebalancing energy prices. On fuel duty, we have been calling for a review of, uh, as a mechanism uh, for demand management for car travel. And whilst the Net Zero strategy from the UK Government emphasises technological advances, it does not go far enough in tackling this issue, presiding officer. Regardless, Scotland is acting uh, decisively, focusing on the transition to clean technology, reducing demand for high emission products and encouraging behaviour shift. To that end, we look forward to sharing our approach with international partners at COP26 as an example of world-leading best practice. Underpinning this, we have set stretching delivery targets, for example, to reduce by 20% uh, by 2030 car kilometres. These are the measures that will help to achieve our targets, presiding officer. I would like to finish by once again welcoming the world to Scotland for COP26 summit in Glasgow and to thank all of those who have contributed to enabling the summit to take place. I echo the First Minister's call for world leaders gathering in Glasgow to take the necessary action in their own countries to keep the target of 1.5 degrees and beyond very much alive. I look forward to contributions this afternoon, President Officer, and I look forward to engaging with delegates and stakeholders over the coming weeks as we take part in COP26. Cabinet Secretary, uh, could I ask you to move the motion, please? Moved. Thank you. Uh, and I call on Liam Kerr to speak to move Amendment 1769.4. Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We too welcome the world to Glasgow next week as the UK takes over the presidency of COP26. It is and it will be an extraordinary event, but one whose importance cannot be downplayed. Now, I've lodged an amendment, which I hereby move, but let me start by acknowledging that the unamended part of the motion picks up what many commentators suggest is our last opportunity to limit global warming and deliver on the Paris Agreement, and that immediate and rapid action on emissions reduction and investment in low emission and zero carbon technology must be made. Which is why I'm pleased that the UK, the United Kingdom, has the opportunity to showcase its track record on combating climate change and to seek to lead by example. That example is clear, yes. Uh, Minister Lawrence Slater. Rishi Sunak spoke today for an hour on the budget without even mentioning climate. He's lowered tax on beer and wine while polluting the rivers. Maybe we should be grateful for that because it sounds like we won't be able to drink the water. And he's uh, incentivized internal flights within the UK by lowering taxes on flights that are already cheaper than train travel. How can you say that the UK is leading on climate change when these are their policies? Liam Kerr, I'll give you a bit of time back. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to the member for the in, inv um, invitation to say how the UK is leading. Well, Britain's cut emissions by about 44% since 1990. That's the fastest decline in the G7, whilst increasing the size of the economy by about 78%. Denmark is the only other OECD country to have achieved a similar level of reductions. The UK is the, highest, the second highest performing country in the Climate Change Performance Index. The Yale ranking of the greenest countries in the world across 32 performance indicators places the UK fourth. And if only climate change and CO2 emissions are measured, second. And what of the leadership role? Well, the UK was the first major economy to put into law targets to reach net zero by 2050 and updated them just this year. The UK is the largest producer of offshore wind energy in the world. The UK is doubling its international climate finance to help developing nations with 11.6 billion a year by 2025. And now, the UK government has produced a net zero strategy in which it sets out how it plans to deliver its net zero targets of 2050. 
which the Cabinet Secretary was a little down on, which is surprising because, of course, the Climate Change Committee described it as ambitious, comprehensive, an achievable and affordable vision which sets a globally deliverable benchmark to take to COP26. They also point out it is the most comprehensive in the G20. Now, I listened earlier this week when Nicola Sturgeon called on world leaders to take credible action, not face-saving slogans to achieve net zero. And listening to the Cabinet Secretary just now with his relentless self-congratulation, perhaps he didn't get the memo, because in data we're all too familiar with, we know that this government missed five out of seven climate targets set out in its 2018 plan. This government has missed their own legal emissions targets for three years in a row. Yeah. This government's commitment to ban biodegradable landfill waste in Scotland by 2021 has been pushed back to 2025. And this government has slashed the budget for agri-environmental measures this year by nearly 10 million. And then, four days before COP26 begins, the new minister, Patrick Harvey, is forced to admit the Scottish government's latest failure on its renewable heat target. World leading targets, Cabinet Secretary, in a catch up plan and matching ambition. Some might say that's a face saving slogan. And we haven't even talked about transport, the largest single source of greenhouse gases, which has only been reduced in Scotland by about 0.5% since 1990. And the context in which car journeys in Scotland have increased is about 8% since 2016. Now, I pointed out in August that to meet the required target of 30,000 EV charges, we need roughly 4,000 extra charging points a year. I asked where the plan was to do that, and yesterday got a parliamentary question answer. There is no plan. And apparently, we learn that there are too few charges in Glasgow to charge the EVs ordered for this summit. Yes. Uh, Sandish Gohani. I thank the member. Uh, with Glasgow on the eve of hosting COP26, Britain's largest ever summit, this SNP-led Glasgow City Council is an utter disgrace by allowing rancid conditions in Glasgow streets to multiply, leading to a cleansing crisis that was entirely preventable. To be clear, the SNP in Glasgow has cut the number of staff in our city's cleansing services, is there a introduced a bulk Is there a question you're putting to Mr Kerr? There Mr. is. Mr. Height, height council tax by 4% every Could we year. Could not have another speech, please? Could you put a question, questions? please, Mr Gohani? So Thank does, you. Does my friend uh, agree that Glasgow Council is miles, miles worse off with the SNP government, uh, with the SNP Leave City care. Council, and is incompetent. Leave care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful to the member for the intervention. I absolutely do agree with that. Um, I think the member makes a very important point in the context of this debate, because this is about COP26, at which, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the eyes of the world will be on Glasgow, an SNP council doing the bidding of an SNP government. And what are delegates coming to? Road closures across the city, ScotRail on strike because the Scottish Government shamefully refuses to get involved and the Minister for Transport has no idea, his own words, why it's happening. Refuse and recycling workers, school cleaners, janitors, catering staff, lawyers on strike thanks to the legacy of nearly £1 billion of SNP cuts to local authority budgets in the last six years, which I suspect is what Dr Golhani was referring to. And an accommodation crisis. As many as 3,000 people coming to Glasgow not yet having anywhere to stay. Well, look, President Officer, COP26 is a fantastic opportunity to showcase the UK and drive some real global change. We must do this together as one united kingdom. Now, the UK government is providing almost £100 million to Scotland for COP26 to ensure this event happens, which I'm delighted about. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be too. Let's together show that leadership have the it, Scottish members government about to conclude. let's together show that leadership have the Scottish government finally start taking that credible action to show the example to the rest of the world and recognize that working together we must seize this last opportunity before it's too late thank you thank you I now call on Monica Lennon to speak to and move amendment 1769.1 Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are just four days to go until COP26 kicks off in Glasgow. And on behalf of Scottish Labour, I'm pleased to be speaking in to be today's debate on the global ambitions for this momentous climate summit. We do need to be honest about the challenges ahead. 
We should take heart that there are solutions and keep a sharp focus on the bold actions that we must take to limit global warming and keep one and a half degrees alive. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, COP26 is regarded as the last best chance to avert climate catastrophe. That is how important this summit is. And while COP26 is focused on securing international agreement, Friends of the Earth Scotland are right to say that the real action to tackle the climate crisis takes place at the national and at the local level. So today we welcome and support the Scottish Government motion, but we should be using this time in the Chamber, and I'm sure the Government will welcome this, to, to, to scrutinise and to challenge the Scottish Government and partners across Scotland to do more and to work with the entire Scottish Parliament, to work with local authorities, with businesses, with citizens to achieve more. In the debate, we'll hear some of the precise actions that need to be given priority by the Scottish Government. But I want to take a, a moment to comment on the unique opportunity we have in Scotland during the 12 days of the summit. The great city of Glasgow is providing the stage for COP26. That should fill us with pride. We should embrace this unique opportunity to show the best of Scotland and to provide leadership at home and internationally. But it is also important that we get our own house in order. That's why the ongoing organisation of workers through their trade unions is a strength. We should welcome that because climate justice and social justice, justice for workers, these are two sides of the same coin. Empowering and valuing workers is key to securing a just transition. So today on these benches, we send a message of solidarity to workers who are taking industrial action and to all those who are fighting for fair work and for climate justice. And as Close the Gap say in their briefing today, we cannot have a just transition without enabling women and men to equally benefit from the shift in the labour market towards green jobs and a new future. So I think that's something that we have to, to reflect on today. We'll hear a lot about ambition. I do see Scotland as an ambitious nation. And the Scottish Government has rightly been working towards ambitious climate targets. But I think we can all uh, take stock uh, listening to Greta Thunberg, who said Scotland is not a world leader on climate change. Well, Greta, not yet, not yet, but we can be. And I hope many of us will be out on the streets of Glasgow uh, with Greta Thunberg, with the workers and with the people of Scotland who want to see urgent change. For our part, Scottish Labour has consistently called on the Scottish Government to be bolder and to take quicker action to tackle climate change because we believe Scotland has the potential to lead Europe's green energy revolution, putting green jobs at the heart of new employment, training and manufacturing opportunities across Scotland. The people of Scotland have promised 100,000 green jobs and a renewables revolution, a fraction of the jobs have been delivered. So we do understand why people across Scotland, particularly in the, in the North East, feel a little bit cynical about the prospect of a just transition. So we must get on and deliver it. Um, looking at some of the targets, I know um, Liam Kerr's um, touched on a, a, a couple of stats that have come out. Today, we've learned that the Scottish Government target of 11% of non-electrical heat demand coming from renewable sources by 2020 uh, was missed. Um, only 6.4% was achieved, and that's a decrease on, on 2019. So we're not quite getting there uh, in, in terms of some of these, these targets. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll speed this up. Um, again, I want to come back to the, the ambition for a public energy company. We don't want that kicked down the road. It's a real opportunity to be a, a game changer. The market-led energy model continues to fail customers and workers. And our transition will simply be too slow if we leave that work in the hands of the market. And in terms of... Um, 
circular economy. I don't know if Maurice Golden is speaking today. I, I think it looks like he will be, so I'm sure he will, will cover that. But I was disappointed about the Scottish Government's um, recent announcement on waste and incineration. Friends of the Earth Scotland have called this position a burner's charter, and I hope the Minister will, will, will reflect on that. Decarbonising transport must be the urgent priority. ScotRail, we're seeing um, proposed cuts 300 service cuts a day. Today we've learned that the day tripper um, concessionary travel scheme is being axed just at a time when COP26 delegates are getting free transport. We're, we're getting a bit muddled here. We've seen buses in my region disappear like the X1. Um, today, I just want to briefly mention Campbell, presiding officer. More than 60 charities, unions and community groups have urged Nicola Sturgeon to explicitly condemn the Campbell oil field proposal. There's a, a letter, an article in the National today, so perhaps my colleagues on the SNP Green Benches will have a read at that. So we need to speak up. Um, the children of Scotland are saying this is a moment. We need to take that moment. We need to put our ambitions into action, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Uh, and I now call Liam MacArthur to speak to and to move Amendment 176, line point 3. Thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, also add my uh, welcome uh, and that of the Scottish Liberal Democrats to delegates and others arriving uh, in Scotland for COP26? As the motion rightly recognises, and others have already said, this may well be humanity's last opportunity to limit global warming and deliver on the ambitions set in the Paris Summit 2015. It is a weighty responsibility, but one we cannot afford to shirk. Uh, ministers often uh, talk of this Parliament having passed world-leading climate legislation. I agree that the legislation passed unanimously by this Parliament is indeed stretching. I am certainly proud of the role my party played in forcing the Government to be more ambitious in setting an interim target of 75 per cent emission reductions by 2030. But Greta Thunberg uh, is right in questioning the extent to which ministers have followed through on the commitments made and the targets set. We know from the figures published back in June that once again the government missed its overall targets. Earlier today, Patrick Harvey revealed that on renewable heat, far from hitting the targets, the government is actually going backwards. In short, we are nowhere near where we need to be in reducing Scotland's emissions. And if the picture is worrying in relation to heat, it is little better when it comes to transport. Domestic transport accounts for around a third of emissions in Scotland. It is the single biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and rates have scarcely budged from 1990 levels. Addressing this should be a priority and will need a multifaceted approach. It must include a step change, for example, in the scale of ambition on EV rollout, including charging infrastructure, incentives and the faster phasing out of petrol and diesel uh, vehicles. It will need the government to reverse cuts to rail services and expand provision as well as accessibility. And it needs, as we will hear in the debate that follows this, a strategic approach to ferry replacement. What it absolutely does not need is this SNP government's continued support for a third runway at Heathrow. Let's be clear, this would deliver 75,000 extra flights and 600,000 extra tonnes of carbon pollution to Scotland. On the eve of COP26, to retain any credibility on climate, the First Minister should rip up the government's contract with Heathrow to support a third runway. And Lorna Slater and Patrick Harvey should be standing by with the recycling bin in which to dump it. Presiding officer, before concluding, I want to briefly highlight what is happening in Orkney, as I believe it offers an insight into what can be done to meet the climate challenges we face. As we heard at the Spree uh, cross-party group last night, Orkney really are the island, energy islands with world firsts and world leading innovation. From the first turbine on Burger Hill in the 1970s, to the European Marine Energy Centre being established in 2003, to the world's most powerful tidal turbine orbital connected earlier this year, as the Minister will know better than most. More recently still, there is the news of plans to transform the oil terminal in Flotta into a hydrogen production facility using offshore wind produced west of Orkney. Tied in with innovative projects looking to develop hydrogen ferries, low emission aircraft and the decarbonisation of heat across the islands, it shows how Orkney is playing a pioneering role in the transition to net zero and the creation of green jobs. It should be backed by both the UK and Scottish Government in terms of funding, but also a supportive regulatory environment. 
and it represents the sort of bold, innovative action we will need to see from Scottish and UK ministers if we are to rise to the challenge of being a global leader in tackling climate change. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Uh, and we now move to the open debate. And I call Fiona Hislop to be followed by Maurice Golden. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Hislop. Presiding officer, we must raise our eyes beyond the horizon of our own interest. And COP must work in leadership as an engine of a global attack on climate emissions, mitigation and adaptation, which brings together the global north and the global south. There is only one world and there is only this one last chance. A just transition means ensuring that nobody is left behind globally as well as nationally. It is vital that world leaders listen, engage and understand those who are experiencing climate change now from the countries and people who did the least to cause the climate emergency. Global South countries are bearing the brunt of global climate change, with warming temperatures, unpredictable weather patterns, driving economic hardship, food insecurity and migration, with mass displacement of peoples. In September this year, the Glasgow Climate Dialogues took place co-convened by Stop Climate Claes Alliance and the Scottish Government, providing detailed recommendations from Global South leadership to inform discussions at COP26. Recommendations from these dialogues include the need for industrialised, polluting countries to significantly increase the financial support available to help impacted communities adapt to spiralling climate impacts and the need to ensure a global just transition based on the UNFCCC principles of common but differentiated responsibilities. Indeed. Liam Kerr. I'm enjoying her contribution thus far. Presumably, the member also welcomes then the doubling of the UK's international climate finance to 11.6 billion a year by 25. I think, I, I think it's really important that we all increase our climate funding, uh, but we can't uh, use it to uh, mask over cuts in international development aid, which the, uh, the, the UK government and indeed others have done. So I think it's really important that we welcome that, but be, be, but be mindful of how it might be presented. Yesterday, I heard from Dr. Asher from the Red Cross Kenya for the, about the need to provide funding uh, for loss, for mitigation and adaptation. And these priorities must be placed at the heart of COP26 by participants. The editors of more than 100 respected medical journals across the world published a common editorial calling for emergency action to limit global temperature increases, restore biodiversity and protect health. The joint article points to the chilling fact that in the past 20 years, heat-related deaths amongst those over 65 had increased by more than 50%. A decade ago, in my previous role as a minister, I remember calling on the EU to prepare for environmental refugees fleeing northern Africa. The displacement of millions of people because of the climate emergency will be a consequence of actions from the polluting global north. People, businesses and organisations across the country are active and ready to work towards the drive to net zero. Just last week in the Festival of Politics, we heard from David Farker, CEO of Intelligent Growth Solutions, who shared the global opportunities of vertical farming to support the exponential global demand for food at a time when we need to reduce farming emissions. This is a great global inv innovation driven from Scotland. Innovation has to be global and it has to be shared. The climate emergency presents us with one big challenge, but there are many solutions and we must be conscious and non-judgmental of how other countries with different experiences strive for change. Scotland and the wider UK who contributed and led the industrial revolution must listen and embrace and not judge too swiftly those who are following our past path but help and share experience in transitioning to greener energy and technologies. So in conclusion, yes, we have one of the most ambitious pieces of climate change legislation in the world. And because of this, we have more responsibility. People around the world will be watching how we turn our goals into actions and we must lead by example. We are going to have to go to move faster, quicker and over more areas with more solutions than we thought. We are going to have to stretch our capabilities. Yes, this is a global challenge, but there is not one global solution. Justice and fairness at home and abroad must be at the heart of our ambitions. We only succeed when we all succeed, east, west, north, and most definitely south. We have one world, we have one chance.
Thank you. Uh, I now call Maurice Golden to be followed by Alistair Allen. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. COP26 has been held against a backdrop of a worsening climate crisis. Over the past year, we have seen severe weather events tear across this planet, soaring temperatures in the US, dust storms and cyclones in the Far East, and flash floods across Europe, including here in the UK. Property has been damaged, businesses ruined, and worst of all, lives have been lost. So there is no doubting the warning from COP26 President Alok Sharma that the cost of inaction on climate change is most definitely greater than the cost of action. We can be proud Britain is taking action, though. Amongst the world's major economies, Britain was the first to establish legal targets to reach net zero by 2050 and is decarbonising the fastest. In fact, Britain is now the second highest performing country in the Climate Change Performance Index. And Britain is committed to helping the rest of the world take climate action as well, committing $11.6 a year by 2025 to help developing nations. The combination of action at home and a helping hand overseas gives Britain enormous climate credibility. We lead by example. And that's vital if we are to convince others to take action needed to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Deputy President Officer, COP26 gives Scotland a platform to aid that effort. What WWF Scotland describe as a historic opportunity to help create a race to the top on climate action. I have always welcomed the Scottish Government setting ambitious climate targets. Ambition that can encourage others to set their own bar higher, especially other devolved governments around the world. Welcome as that ambition is, there is simply no getting around the fact emissions targets have been missed for three years in a row. So where the Conservative UK Government is building credibility, this SNP Green Coalition is running it out. To be credible, the Scottish Government must, at a minimum, deliver Scotland's emissions targets. We can afford no more excuses. Not my words, but a damning assessment from Oxfam. And this is the SNP's problem on the environment. Quick to tell everyone what they want to do, just not very good at actually doing it. And let's look at that record. Yes, happy to. Minister Mara McCallan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It was very um, enlightening to hear the member discuss Britain's credentials in tackling the climate emergency. I wonder if he might want to reflect how much Scotland's renewable potential and the ample scope of our natural environment, including in peatland restoration and tree planting, given that we are planting 80% of the UK's trees, just how much that's contributed to Britain's credentials that he mentions. Well, well let's, look, let's look at the SNP's track record. Air quality standards not been met for 10 years in a row. Out of 20 international biodiversity targets, over half were missed. The renewable heat target has been missed, along with the target for locally generated renewables. Recycling is going backwards, with a rate worse than 2016. Incineration capacity is skyrocketing, and SNP and Greens could end up having to import waste to burn. Glasgow, COP26 host city, the SNP-run council has plunged the city into a growing crisis of rubbish and rats. But that's not all. They failed to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016. They broke their promise to deliver 28,000 green jobs. They failed to meet their cycling target. Currently, it will take 290 years to make it. Public transport and active travel use for commuters is down. 2% of plastic waste collected here in Scotland is actually recycled here. Three tons, a minute of, uh, three tons of waste a minute leave Scotland. They failed to introduce a landfill ban on biodegradable waste. DRS is a shambles. Businesses are in the dark, even though the SNP has been working on it for a decade. And they cancelled Zero Waste Scotland's textiles programme. Deputy Presiding Officer, I genuinely hope Scotland can set out an example for the rest of the world. But with the SNP and the Greens in government, I really fear for it. Uh, thank you. I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Neil Bibby and uh, up to four minutes, please. Presiding officer, 
1869, a poem was collected by the folklorist Alexander Carmichael in Eochgar in South Uist and published in the second volume of Carmina Gadelica. The poem predicts this for one fertile coastal area of Uist. Toronish of the barley with the great sea around its middle, the walls of the churches shall be the fishing rocks of the people, while the resting place of the dead shall be a forest of tangles, among whose mazes the pale-faced mermaid, the marled seal and the brown otter shall race and run and leap like the children of men at play. The poem is, members may find, unnervingly prophetic of the coming disasters which sea level rises will bring to coastal regions across the world, unless the reference to mermaids makes you inclined to dismiss it. This is, I should say, uh, far from the only unsettling and very specific prophecy of its kind in Gaelic folklore. It mirrors many of the same fears now voiced within contemporary scientific debate. Presiding officer, global sea levels rose by three centimetres in the past decade, but it is predicted to get worse. The most recent UN report on climate change in August 2021 warned that we could see the ocean ascend nearly one metre or more by the end of the century. Such outcomes threaten many societies existentially. Under that scenario, island nations such as the Maldives and Tuvalu will simply disappear. Cities including New York, Shanghai and Kolkata will be exposed to coastal flooding by 2070 and Bangladesh could lose up to a fifth of its land mass displacing some 15 to 20 million people. And Scotland will not be immune. Among places which will be particularly vulnerable are low-lying areas with soft coasts of Machar, including Uist, Isla and Tyree, as well as Sandy in Orkney. Large tracts of arable land in Uist were created through centuries of drainage programmes. However, this means that land is often below the mean high water mark. If a storm large enough broke through the Macher dunes, this land could become inundated, possibly permanently so. In the aftermath of the deadly 2005 storm, the primary school close to the shore in Balavanich was abandoned and a new one built further away from the sea. Presiding officer, multiply that up and you see the kind of threat and cost that now faces human infrastructure across much of the planet. But the climate crisis will undermine intangible cultural heritage too, many of the kinds of things that make it worth being human. So it is important that the debates on climate change uh, take notice of indigenous voices in addition to science and reflect on the cumulative experience and knowledge of these societies, whether they be in Greenland or Tuvalu or Uist. The Gaelic word for a person, Dunya, literally means one who is from the land. They inhabit a homeland, or Dewey. The social and ecological bond which ties the two together is Dewchus, an untranslatable concept comprising heritage, culture, ancestry and identity concentrated within a place made sacred. Be in no doubt that rising sea levels represent a threat to all of that as well as to everything else. We should listen, presiding officer, to the breadth and depth of information that exists in endangered and indigenous languages across the globe. This information is not only relevant to fully understanding the crises we face, it may perhaps just also point to a way out of them. Thank you. I now call Neil Bibby to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister said earlier this week that COP26 must produce credible action, not face-saving solutions. I would certainly agree with that. Yet, unfortunately, face-saving is the default setting of this government all too often. No platitudes to world leaders, no gestures at the conference, no greenwashing of the government benches here in Holyrood can change that. On so many issues, there is a gulf between rhetoric and reality under the SNP, and it has been exposed by COP. This is no time for self-congratulation in Scottish politics. It is time for some self-awareness in Scottish politics, and the Scottish Government must confront their own record. President Officer, the Government motion specifically refers to the cooperation agreement between the Scottish Greens and the SNP. And it is what that agreement means for transport that I want to address today, uh, which we know from other speakers is a major emitter. 
Uh, the Labour amendment in the name of Monica Lennon makes clear delivering better regulated, uh, regular connected, affordable public transport in the interests of Scotland's passengers is one of the principal ways in which we can make a difference. But as Monica Lennon also said, on the very day that the SNP Greens announced their coalition, ScotRail unveiled a consultation on a new timetable that will cut 300 services per day on pre-pandemic levels. That means drastic reductions in rail services to and from Glasgow, uh, the COP26 host city. Now, the Transport Minister has defended that consultation. He has refused to accept calls to restore services to pre-pandemic levels. He has ignored those cautioning against reducing rail capacity when we are facing a climate emergency. I would be interested to hear uh, the thoughts of the Green Minister uh, on that in summing up, perhaps. Um, we know car travel has already returned to pre-pandemic levels, but public transport has not. And modal shift to our railways is essential, but we cannot achieve modal shift uh, that Scotland needs if government makes it harder for people to leave the car at home. And that's a critical challenge for us. President officer, I want to acknowledge the rail workers who kept Scotland moving throughout the pandemic. Even if there is a resolution to the outstanding RMPT dispute, which will happen during COP, the past few months have still been immensely difficult for industrial relations on the railways. The Scottish Government must take their share of responsibility for that. Going forward, the new publicly owned ScotRail must pr provide proper representation for trade unions and its governance structures. Passengers must be represented too. They deserve uh, improving affordable services. There is no reason to hike passenger fares in the coming year, which is what is set to happen, again chasing people away from using public transport. However, President Officer, the most common form of public transport is not the train, it is the bus. And yet bus services, as Monica Lennon also said, are in decline too here in Scotland. Under the SNP, the total number of bus passenger journeys in Strathclyde in the south west, home of the Glasgow city region, again the whole city of COP, has fallen by 79 million. 48 million vehicle kilometres have been lost from the bus network in the same Greater Glasgow and Strathclyde area. Fares are up a fifth, so I'll give way to Mr Kerr. Uh, very briefly, because these members are just about to conclude. Mr Kerr. I'm very grateful. Is, is it the member going to address the fact that Graham Simpson found that there's a 640 million black hole in the SNP's attempt to decarbonise our buses? Mr Bibby. We, we, cl we clearly need investment in our bus, um, uh, our bus network if we are going to be serious about tackling climate change, uh, and the government need to ensure, again, that the uh, rhetoric is matching with the reality and the proper resources that's needed. The bus market is broken in Glasgow, it's broken in the west of Scotland. Uh, Labour have fought for improvements to the transport bill uh, to make local con public control a reality through public ownership. Uh, but the Scottish Government's Bus Partnership Fund is directed at operator-friendly improvements. There is no strategy to intervene in the market in Glasgow or anywhere else in Scotland and put the interests of passengers first. If public control is good enough for Edinburgh buses, if it is good enough for London buses, if it is good enough for the modern thriving cities of Europe, then why is it not good enough for Glasgow and the west of Scotland? Public transport should be a public service again if we are serious about tackling the climate emergency. Thank you. I now call uh, Colette Stevenson to be followed by Mark Roscoe. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. The IPCC's Code Red report shows the clear threat facing the world. But there's, there is still time, if we act now, to take collective action and limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. As the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, it is right that Scotland is at the forefront of the Green Revolution. Action is required at the local, national and international levels. In terms of the local, lots of important work has been done to position East Kilbride as a smart, sustainable town. I recently visited an award-winning East Kilbride business, Retech, which focuses on sustainable IT asset disposal. It was great to see how their operations make a positive impact in the fight against climate change. And I hope companies like that will continue to grow at home and abroad. The Scottish Government 
is committed to raising global climate ambition and action at all levels and from all sections of society. Launching the world's first climate justice fund almost a decade ago, the SNP government recognises that those suffering most from climate change are those who have done little to cause it. Recently, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland and the Scottish Government co-convened the Glasgow Climate Dialogues, enabling citizens from the Global South to publish their COP26 demands. As the First Minister said earlier this week, Scotland will help those around the negotiating table listen to activists, including from the Global South. Indeed. Monica Lennon. Grateful to collect Stevenson. Um, to return to East Kilbride very, very briefly, does the member agree that the news that the duelling of the East Kilbride Railway has been axed is the wrong decision? And will she ask the, the, the ministers to, to get back on the table and make sure that we get this back on track? Colette Stevenson. Thank you to the member. Yeah, I have written to the Minister for Transport outlining some of the, the issues that have been raised as well um, at a local level from East Kilbride. So thank you. Uh, just moving on, another important voice in this debate is that of young people, many of whom are so engaged in the fight against global warming. Greta Thunberg will be in Glasgow and I am sure will inspire even more young people to stand up for their future. It's so important that children and young people are able to speak out and encourage leaders to go further. That's why it's so welcome that the Scottish Government is supporting the COP26 Youth Climate Programme with an investment of £450,000 and £350,000 for the Conference of Youth. I am really looking forward to taking part in the moment on Friday. It will be great to chat with pupils from St Vincent's Primary and East Kilbride, as well as a group of secondary school pupils to discuss the climate and hear the actions they want taken. The legacy of COP26 has to be rooted in actions. It is our best and possibly last chance to achieve what is required to safeguard our planet. Following the Paris Agreement in 2015, the Scottish Government set a legally binding 2030 target to reduce emissions of all major greenhouse gases by at least 75 per cent, compared to baseline levels. Furthermore, we will end Scotland's contribution to climate change by 2045. We must, however, deliver a just transition to net zero for people in all parts of Scotland, but also for people in all corners of the globe. President Officer, Scotland is the right place for a COP focused on delivery and action. We are ready to play our part in delivering successful outcomes. And importantly, the Scottish Government will ensure the voices of everyone, including our young people and citizens of the Global South, are heard. Thank you. Uh, and before I call Mark Ruskell, just to remind members, the spe speeches are up to four minutes. Uh, we have no extra time, and therefore, uh, if you wish to take an intervention, by all means do, but it will be part of your, uh, your speech uh, time, timing. Thank you. Mr Ruskell, to be followed by Jenny Minto. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, you know, COP26 is now finally here, and I'm sure many of us in this chamber will have mixed emotions, perhaps a sense of relief that it's finally happening, a sense of hope and a sense of belief that we can deliver better agreements through uh, the, the Glasgow talks. But I would hope also a sense of collective guilt as well, that there's no government around the world that's made sufficient enough action to really tackle this crisis. And the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement really provided a skeleton uh, of the framework to keep needed to keep the world within 1.5 degrees. But it's the Glasgow COP that must now flesh that out with ambition from all nations, acting in solidarity with those who've contributed the least to the crisis, but will inevitably suffer the most. Now, the pledges made from states so far simply don't add up. And we're heading towards nearly three degrees of global heating, which would be a huge climate injustice. A crisis based on the idea that some people are worth more than others, as Greta Thunberg has described it. And it's the voice of the marginalised and colonised global south that needs to be heard loud and clear at COP26. And I look forward to the Scottish Government amplifying those voices using the Glasgow Dialogues communique. 
The focus on how we cut emissions is critical, but it cannot crowd out discussion and agreement on how to compensate the vast loss and damage to life and the economy that is already happening in the global south. The annual $100 billion pledge made in Paris to help countries adapt is just the starting point and must be delivered in full. And this is just the first bill from the cleaner half of the world to the developed nations like us for using our shared atmosphere as a waste dump for generations. It must be paid in full. Now, presiding officer, there are, I suspect, many different COPs taking place in Glasgow, in the blue and green zones, on the streets and in private lobbying spaces. And for many business sectors that will be providing the products, services and hopefully the fair work of the future, COP is a great opportunity to build confidence that rapid change is possible now. There is a first mover advantage for governments to drive recovery through investment in innovation supply chains while creating entirely new markets. But I think we also have to recognise that for many fossil fuel corporations, COP26 is a further opportunity to steal the narrative around just transition, just as they have attempted to control the narrative for years about whether climate change was real. Many corporations continue to spin the myth that maximising economic recovery of every last drop of fossil fuel reserves is totally compatible with climate objectives, while parading false solutions such as negative emissions technologies as being capable of allowing their business model, models to continue largely unchained, unchanged. The time has come for all governments to stop copying and pasting drivel from fossil fuel corporations into their energy strategies. For example, the concept of a net zero basin in the North Sea is utterly meaningless when industry wants to scale up from 6 billion to 20 billion barrels of oil and gas extraction. The UN production gap report last week showed how states are planning to allow the extraction of double the amount of fossil fuels that we can afford to burn if we're to stay under 1.5 degrees. And then, presiding officer, we wonder why young people are so angry about the failure of governments the to address only this left. basic fact of physics. The politics and the action has to be in line with the science, and so far it is nowhere close. So, presiding officer, in, in conclusion, the post-COP legacy from us in this parliament to the young climate strikers, the global south and the world will be to double down on our own climate plans, take responsibility, drive a real just transition, and deliver the system change needed to tackle climate change. The hard work has barely even begun. Thank you. I now call on Jenny Minto to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been dipping into the Radio 4 series, 39 Ways to Save the Planet, and one episode caught my attention. It was called Local Wisdom. The programme suggested that Indigenous knowledge and direct historical experience had lots to offer the world in the journey to net zero. Whether this wisdom is the knowledge that's been passed down through the generations by the Inuits or the astute observations in a hundred-year-old Isla Farmer's diary, these are insightful glimpses into our, how our forebears lived their lives in tune with nature. So how do we get back to that? Well, COP26 in Glasgow is a great opportunity. Not a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but perhaps a once-in-a-species opportunity, our species. We should not only demand that our leaders hammer out solutions, we need to inspire them to do so. I get my inspiration and my optimism for the future from the local wisdom I find in abundance in my own community. I suggest that world leaders do the same, to keep 1.5 alive. Across Argyll and Butte, people are engaging in finding solutions for climate change and a just transition. Time for Change Argyll is one such group, and it is mobilising for a better world, joining the school strikes at Loch Gilphead Joint Campus and then creating a great blue wave of people along the seafront at Oban to represent rising sea levels and flooding caused by climate change, but also celebrating our fantastic coastal communities that we must protect. The Dynamic Coast Project has been providing strategic evidence on the extent of coastal erosion ac across Scotland since 2012. And as Alistair Allen mentioned, Tyree's natural beaches and sand dunes have in the past provided important protection to the low-lying land behind. These must continue to be valued and managed to continue providing this protection. 
As part of COP26, the former slate-producing island of Ling has been chosen as one of the six sites across Scotland to have a Royal Institute of Architects marker made from traditional materials to highlight places potentially affected by rising water levels. Ling, like the neighbouring island of Easdale, is itself suffering from serious coastal erosion. Its community is investigating different ways to reduce the erosion and working with Dynamic Coast, giving them a framework to do so. Separately, the community is exploring with Hess and High the possibility of mining sleet again, starting a community enterprise to provide local material for local use and creating local jobs, bringing back traditional skills to work with a local resource. In other words, local wisdom combining with science to find workable solutions. And there are many, many more projects happening across Argyll and Butte. Sea Wilding is returning native oysters to Loch Craigenish. They create complex reefs where young fish thrive and biodiversity increases, restoring the health of a local marine environment. Local people working with the scientists at SAMS. Fine Futures on Butte are aiming for a carbon zero island. They have a myriad of projects, from electric bikes to upcycling furniture. And this year's project encourages activities around growing food, sharing food, and making use of local resources whilst learning new skills. And farmers across Argyll and Butte who are committed to sustainability but need to be involved in the decisions that will affect them as they know what works for their land. So COP26 in Glasgow will bring together senior politicians and scientists from all over the world. But as well as talking, they need to listen. They need to listen to the women and men of their own communities, people who already possess the local will and wisdom to, com com to combat climate change. Of course, I think Argyll and Butte is special, but it's not alone in being home to people with the local wisdom to find the solutions for climate change. The great and the good at COP26 in Glasgow need to listen to them. Thank you. Thank you. I call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Katie Clark. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This debate is titled COP26 Action and Ambition. I fear we'll see little of the former and only warm words about the latter, because that's what we get in SNP Scotland. Just today, we learned that its target to meet 11% of non-electrical heat demand from renewable sources by 2020 has been missed by a mile. Most of the people of Glasgow and the surrounding area are going to be unaffected by COP26, unless they want to get into and across the city centre, of course. And to that end, it will cause a big amount of hassle and inconvenience. Delegates will get the five-star treatment and be kept away from the rubbish in the streets or the creaking public transport system, while locals are told to keep their distance for the fortnight. If anyone does want to get into Glasgow, there'll be little point in driving, so you would think that turning to public transport might be an option. Well, not if the RMT have anything to do with it. The barons of that particular union have decided the latest pay offer shouldn't be put to members and are hell-bent on causing chaos, unless they've changed their minds in the last couple of hours. To strike for the entire period of the conference is irresponsible. They should do the right thing and ditch the strikes. Perhaps if the Transport Minister did what I've been urging him to do for weeks and get round the table with the RMT, then they could be persuaded to tone down the posturing, for that's what it is. They know nationalisation is coming and they smell blood. Well, we can see through it, so they need to grow up. Because after the conference, we need a transport system that's greener. Transport's the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. We all know that we need to decarbonise the way we travel. So it's quite ironic that delegates to the conference will be ferried around in electric cars, charged up at EV points, powered by diesel generators. Who are we trying to kid here? Or they may, if they're lucky, get to go on an electric bus. The Coalition of Chaos's programme for go no, no. The Coalition of Chaos's programme for government announced plans to remove the remaining 4,400 diesel buses currently on the road by 2023. That's a noble and lofty ambition that they'll get nowhere near achieving at current rates. There's £50 million in the pot from the Scottish Zero Emission Bus Challenge Fund, 
when it will take 640 million to replace those 4,400 buses. Now, I'll be taking part in a mass cycle ride to Glasgow a week on Saturday. People from all parts of the UK are wheeling their way to the city, which leads me on to action and ambition. If we want to get people out of cars and onto bikes or public transport, then that needs to be funded. You don't achieve that by cutting rail services and cutting uh, projects like the East dueling of the East Kilbride line that the member for East Kilbride uh, didn't give an opinion on earlier. You don't do that. As a, now, a Cycling Scotland survey showed that people would be motivated to cycle if there were more cycle, cycle lanes, traffic-free routes and off-road cycle paths because the main barrier to cycling is not feeling safe on the roads. Cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh need to show the ambition of, say, Paris and make them bike and pedestrian friendly. And we need properly organised and integrated public transport systems like London or Manchester. I'm afraid, presiding officer, Glasgow is not miles better on this or anything, rats apart, but the COP26 delegates won't get to see any of that. Thank you. Katie Clark to be followed by co -Cab Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. And I believe this parliament needs to be very clear that we need ambitious outcomes from COP26. And I don't think party political point scoring is necessarily the way to do that. So I hope that over the coming days that we are able to unite with a very clear message on behalf of the people of Scotland that we want to see ambitious outcomes and that we amplify some of the more radical voices that we are going to hear um, over the coming days and raise our game. And I say that because I think we all need to be humble and recognise the challenge that we face. Greenhouse gas concentrations are at their highest levels in two million years. In 2018, the UN, based on the work of scientists and government reviewers, said that it was necessary that global temperatures rose no more, no more than 1.5% to help us avoid the worst climate impacts and maintain a livable climate. Even 1.5% of warming will lead to wildfires, dwindling biodiversity, storms growing even more powerful, oceans becoming more acidic and killing off our seas and indeed many of the parts of the planet that we've become so aware of according to Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. So I think the first thing that this parliament should be saying, really, is that actually we have a duty to speak on behalf of the people of Scotland. We recognise that Scotland doesn't necessarily have a status as such in these negotiations, but our role as the host is one where I believe um, that we are uniquely placed um, to give a very clear message and to work with those who are campaigning, who will be on our streets and will be arguing from all parts of the world that it is necessary for there to be a far more ambitious um, approach to the challenge that we face. We are not one of the 10 countries with the largest emissions. Um, we have, however, um, as has already been said, um, the, the history of the Industrial Revolution and we've helped to contribute to the situation um, that we are in. And between um, 1988 and 2015, 100 companies producing fossil fuels were responsible for 71% um, of all um, global emissions. And I do think that, you know, as a, a major um, country that is involved in the energy sector, um, that we need to have a very, very clear and distinct message in terms of what we say. Um, because the role of oil and gas 
um, which make up 75% of all Scotland's energy consumption, which make up 90% of all heat demand and represent 6.6% of Scotland's GDP and indeed support over 100,000 work as well, jobs as well as um, being a massive export. 82% um, of Scotland's oil and gas is exported is a key issue. Um, in these discussions, and the voice of the Scottish Parliament and the voice of the Scottish Government needs to be heard. Um, there has been a lot said about transport in this debate, and of course Scotland no longer has any domestic capacity to build and maintain its own trains, um, and as has already been said, there are massive cuts in train services coming, which is far from the message um, that we want to be sent um, in, when we are welcoming delegates um, in a few days' time. So, Parliament, um, I think we need to send a really clear message. I hope that the party political bickering is not mainstream in that message and that we unite over the coming days to say that we stand with young people in this country, we stand with those on the streets, we stand with the trade unions and we will fight and argue for a more ambitious um, proposal to come out of COP26 um, and that as politicians we will be fighting for that. Thank you. I call Kopab Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to contribute to this afternoon's debate. The impact of COP26 is being felt right across Glasgow, but it is in the former industrial communities of Anderson, Finiston and York Hill that global leaders, delegates and activists will descend in order to discuss and debate the best ways forward for our environment and ultimately our planet. As a nation, Scotland's impact on the world has been significant, and central to this has always been our greatest resource, our people. The excellence of our thinkers and those institutions that educate them continue to be pivotal and will undoubtedly impact the conversations taking place at COP26. We know the work to develop a critical thought must start early, and I warmly welcome Glasgow Caledonians' initiative, the Caledonian Club, who work with schools in Glasgow to equip primary five and primary six pupils to answer questions like, what is climate change and its effects, and what can I do to raise awareness about climate change? Glasgow Caledonian University are also supporting a series of talks focusing on the climate emergency, involving local and international experts in conversation with girls from Glasgow. This focus on young people and providing them with an environment and platform to flourish is shared by Strathclyde University, who are hosting the United Nations Climate Change Conference of Youth. This event is designed to help prepare young people for their participation in COP26 and ensure that the voice of youth is heard. Against the backdrop of Brexit and the hostile immigration policies of the United Kingdom, I welcome these demonstrations of international cooperation that reinforce Scotland does not share in an isolationist dogma, but instead embraces an outward and collaborative approach to solving truly global problems. Indeed, COP26 is a unique opportunity to showcase Scotland to the world, including what we are doing to meet our world-leading climate targets. A perfect example of this is in Glasgow Kelvin's business, Catrick Technologies. Their CEO moved from India to Scotland in order to attend the Nautical College before eventually graduating from Strathclyde University with a master's degree and an idea. This idea developed into a technology to capture, converge and convert energy from waste heat, wind and waves into mechanical vibrations producing profitable zero-carbon electricity. Truly revolutionary work being done in Glasgow that could power our homes and electric cars for many years to come. Once again, the excellence of Scottish education, which has been safeguarded by successive SNP governments, attracted and developed the best and brightest, and we are delighted to call Catrick Technologies a local success. In summing up, with the Scottish Government committed to delivering the ambitious targets of net zero emissions by 2045 and an interim target of a 75% reduction by 2030, I am proud of the world-leading research and development that is currently underway in Kelvin and Scotland and work that could provide the solutions to those global challenges 
being addressed at COP26. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to winding up speeches and I call on Liam MacArthur. Um, tackling the climate emergency um, we have heard today must be a shared uh, national and indeed global endeavour. The IPCC has made clear that we do not have the luxury of time and everything that we do needs, be, needs to be seen through the prism of the climate emergency. And therefore, I think it was right that Fiona Hislop urged us to raise our horizons, um, particularly in the interest of those affected most, uh, but least responsible for and least able to cope with the effects of climate change. But even in our own self-interest, the need to act is obvious. I thought Alistair Allen made uh, an excellent um, speech and pointed to the impacts uh, of rising sea levels uh, and the, in the uh, communities he represents. Um, he even alluded to the island I was brought up on, uh, which uh, I have long known as, as, as low-lying and at particular risk of rising sea levels. Um, and therefore, in a spirit of our own self-interest, we need to be um, uh, acting. Morris Golden, uh, I thought, graphically outlined um, the worsening picture that we're seeing um, in terms of severe weather patterns. Um, in terms of the, the costs that this is incurring, and I think it reminds us that uh, the costs of in, inaction um, are considerably greater than any costs we face in taking uh, the required action, and actually the fatal consequences we are seeing uh, more and more. Um, I thought Katie Clark um, made a, a reasonable point in, in pointing to the uh, perhaps predictable back and forth we had between uh, SNP and Tory colleagues, uh, between who should shoulder more blame, the, the uh, accusation and counter-accusation about missed targets, counterproductive uh, actions and the need to do more. But, but frankly, um, the UK government and the Scottish government, and as Mark Ruskell, I think, probably fairly said, um, all governments uh, clearly need to be doing more. Um, I set out earlier some of the actions Scottish Liberal Democrats have been proposing, whether in terms of Climate Emergency Community Fund, a Highlands and Islands Just uh, Transition uh, Commission. And in the area of transport, which was, I think, the focus of um, many uh, colleagues' remarks, and Neil Bibby uh, in particular, I think focused on this and the need for a modal uh, shift and, and, and making it easier for people to get out of their cars. But even where they remain in their cars, we need to reduce the carbon uh, impact of that. We need to expand the, the charging infrastructure for EVs. We need to see um, government-backed um, rental schemes and indeed loan schemes uh, to increase uh, the take-up. And we need to decarbonise other areas of transport as well. And I pointed in my own remarks uh, to what is happening in Orkney in relation uh, to ferries and in terms of uh, air services. And this matters because, as Graham Simpson reminded us, transport is Scotland's largest source of emissions. Uh, and Heathrow is the single biggest producer of emissions, yet the Scottish Government hold a contract with the single biggest polluter aimed at adding around 75,000 flights between Scotland and London by 2040. That is not tenable, it is not credible and it is not sustainable. And the First Minister should be uh, encouraged by her Green colleagues, by her own members, to bin this ahead of COP26. Because we have heard a great deal today about this being our last best chance. Um, but in order to take advantage of what Jenny Minto described as a once in a species opportunity, we need to move from talk of world leading legislation to world leading action. The world is watching, and COP26 must see the Scottish, the UK, and all governments walk the talk. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call on Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's motion recognises the disproportionate impact of climate change on those least responsible for it. And as colleagues across the Chamber have said today, we are seeing this right across the world, from coastal erosion in Bangladesh to erratic rainfall and droughts in Malawi. So we need to work together. I was delighted to see the Dear Green Place launch in the Scotsman today. It's a Glasgow-inspired partnership storytelling project linking young people from the countries most acutely affected by the climate emergency with journalism students in Scotland and across the UK. It aims to raise awareness amongst the public and add to the voices calling for climate justice from world leaders who are arriving in our Dear Green Place for the world's biggest climate change conference. 
And this is absolutely vital because we need the leaders gathering in Glasgow to make the necessary changes in their own countries to keep the target of 1.5 degrees alive, make sure it's achieved and vitally deliver on the funding commitments made in Paris to support countries in the global south in tackling climate change and its impacts. But while the Cabinet Secretary talked about the importance of action on a global uh, scale in his opening remarks, he did not really reflect on the fact that the annual emissions targets have been missed for three years in a row by the SNP Government. So that is why we are calling today on the Coalition SNP Green Government to use the powers it has, such as planning powers, to realise Scotland's full potential in the renewable energy sector, to create local green jobs in communities across Scotland, to implement a bold industrial strategy, to grow domestic supply change, and take the necessary steps to secure a just transition for Scotland so that no one, no family, no community is left behind as we transition to net zero. And that needs political leadership that Monica Lennon highlighted in her speech. We need bold action in our homes, how they're insulated, how they're heated, and use this to drive fuel poverty into a thing of the past. One in four of our households were experiencing fuel poverty in 2019, and that was before this year's rising costs. So we need the action, the community and cooperative heat networks that we know work, but our councils need the support and the finance from the Scottish Government to deliver. It is a huge opportunity to create jobs and training right across our society and to reach every one of our communities. But as others have commented, we need our governments to work together, something we do not see happening. The SNP minister um, won't work with his own colleagues in local government in Glasgow to get a solution for the workers who are so vital to maintaining a healthy environment in the city. The Conservatives in the UK Parliament haven't convened a JMC meeting bringing national and devolved governments around the table since 2018. Why has there not been a JMC on climate and environmental issues set up? Posturing right across the chamber will not solve the climate emergency, as several colleagues have commented. Where is the work on cross-border high-speed rail? Where is the new capacity to ensure an increase in long-distance freight? We have also called for better interconnected and affordable public transport. And again, support across the Chamber for this and investment in active travel. If we are going to get modal shift from cars, we need better alternatives. We need to entice people, make it possible for them to use different options. And we've seen discussions going down to the wire with the rail unions. It's been embarrassing to watch over months as we've seen the government dragging its feet on giving key workers a fair pay deal. And that's against the backdrop of the cut services that Neil Bibby talked about. We need action. We need more public transport, not less, especially after a pandemic where people are using their cars more. Train use is 50 per cent lower than pre-pandemic levels, and research shows that many people are deterred from using trains because they're worried about the enforcement of face coverings and they're worried about social distancing from other passengers. But look forward. Passengers could also be facing potential fare hikes of up to 200 quid extra for a se season ticket on key commuter routes that are already expensive. So we need to encourage people. We need to make it possible. More attractive services, more affordable services. So, for example, let's go for a rail fare freeze as a start. Will the Scottish Government sign up to this? And as Neil Bibby said, we also need to make bus services more reliable, more usable, more affordable. We've got the example in Lothian of municipal ownership. It works. It's award-winning. So can we not just have this across the country and let our councils work together using the powers we had in the Transport Act where we amended it? So let us get the action. I hope ministers will reflect on today's speeches right across this chamber because there is political agreement on the core things where we can act where this Parliament and this Government can get the powers that we already have and use them. I hope we'll see the political support to get moving. In concluding, I want to go back to my opening comment about the importance of fairness and the importance of a just transition in Scotland and our support for the Global South next week. We need to act. We need to get the change needed. And as people arrive in Glasgow, let's look at the distribution of vaccines as well. Oxfam, Christian Aid and the Global Vaccine Alliance have done a brilliant job raising awareness on this. 
But of the 1.8 billion doses promised by rich countries, only 14% have been delivered, and at a UK level, less than 10% of what was promised. So it's in our collective interest that we work together. We need to act. The spirit of COP means we stand together, and as with tackling the climate emergency, Getting the virus under control means working together. So I hope the Minister will commit to act in her closing speech. We need to work together on a climate emergency and COVID recovery. It's in our global collective interest. Let's get the political commitment to work across this chamber to make the change we need now, not in 20 years' time when it's too late. Thank you. I call on Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am delighted to be closing this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. As speakers have said, COP26 is a hugely significant event. It, it cannot be understated that the opportunity here, as has been said before, is the best and probably last opportunity to reverse the global climate emergency. It is a global crisis which will require global solutions. So despite the absence of some significant global players, as the UK takes over the presidency of COP, the eyes of the world will look expectantly and hopefully towards Glasgow. Warm words will not cut it. Targets without deliverable outcomes can no longer be acceptable. It has been a bit of a predictable debate, and we've had the Scottish Government keen to avoid talking about their consistent failed record on climate change targets. I think a point hammered home by that guru of the circular economy, Maurice Golden, in a speech that laid bare these failures. We have heard from across the chamber the denigration of Glasgow under the stewardship of an SNP-led council. A wee spruce up is all that is required, declared the council leader. I think anyone who frequents the city cannot fail to be shocked at the speed with which this great city has been allowed to become dirty, litter-strewn and rat-infested. However, in a spirit of collaboration, can I agree with the Scottish Government Minister Lorna Slater, who declared pre-election, and I quote, we have practical, costed policies for a fair and green recovery, nearly all of which we can implement under the current constitutional arrangement. We do not need to wait for independence. She is, of course, right. However, roll forward to post-election and a ministerial car later, and the same Scottish Government Minister then does a screeching U-turn and says, and I quote, I don't see how I can realistically talk about tackling the climate crisis when I don't have the powers to do all those things. Well, which one is it? Perhaps the Minister will enlighten us in closing. What the Scottish Conservatives say is this. With COP26 on our doorstep, the time to take definitive action has to be now. Presenting officer, we're a small country, so what can we be expected to do given the global nature of this crisis. Well, we can lead by example. We can immerse and weave climate change and the green economy learnings and qualifications throughout the education system, and delivering the skills required for the jobs of the future. Innovation is the key. I think that was a point that Fiona Hislop made, I thought, in a, a very balanced speech. Education is completely devolved to the Scottish Government. But as I have said before in debate, we import too much of the technology for wind power and import much of the servicing expertise. The Scottish Government have had years to think and sort this out. It was Alex Salmond, I don't know if you remember him, who declared that Scotland would become the Saudi Arabia of wind. However, the Scottish Government have failed to recognise and act upon the economic and environmental opportunity, preferring to blame Westminster. We can demonstrate that transitioning to a green economy does not mean abandoning a growing economy. Progress has been made. Liam Kerr quite rightly pointed out in his speech that Britain has cut emissions by about 44 per cent since 1990, the fastest decline in the G7, whilst increasing the size of the economy by 78 per cent. The UK is the second highest performing country in the Climate Change Performance Index, and the UK is measured as the fourth greenest country in the world. It is not enough, of course, a, a, a rare uh, point of agreement here with Mark Ruskell, I have to say, and we need to accelerate that transition significantly. But it does show us that the road we must travel can support a robust economy. The change at this scale and pace will require significant funding, and governments will not be able to foot all of that bill. So we need a collaboration from both the public and the private sectors. And so many potential projects, seed funding from government will lead to significant private investment. But the Scottish Government record on this, I have to say, is absolutely abysmal. And there's little wonder with the, the government's partner in, partners in crime, the Greens, who are against growth 
and a Scottish Government who have neglected the private sector for too long. How on earth can we expect the private sector to be an enthusiastic partner of the Government so hostile and distant from private enterprise? We need to help the transition from oil and gas economy, especially in transport and heating, a step that the oil and gas sector recognise and are already doing. Investing in renewables, in wind, in tidal, in hydrogen, among others. We need their R&D budgets, their innovation. Instead, we have a government minister hell-bent on mollifying them at every opportunity. Patrick Harvey's heat and building strategy requires input from the private sector, a point that was conceded by the Cabinet Secretary. And I look forward to Mr Harvey uh, reporting on his negotiations with the private sector. I did ask him a couple of weeks ago when the Scottish Government would be able to give consumers the date for replacing gas boilers with hydrogen boilers, and he did inadvertently give away the Scottish Government's built-in excuse for not hitting the target. He will, of course, blame Westminster when the target he set is missed on a paper that he produced. Moving transport away from fossil fuels is an essential element, but as Graham Simpson pointed out, Scottish Government has announced plans to remove the remaining 4,400 diesel buses currently on the road by 2023 are plans they know they will not meet. The considerable financial investment aside, the charging infrastructure and the network capability is not there. At some point, the Scottish Government have got to realise that it is outcomes that will tackle the climate emergency, not targets designed to create headlines. Presenting officer, COP26 will come and go in our hopes are that the world will finally collaborate to get a global grasp of the climate emergency and put significant policies in place. Anything less has got to be too little. For Scotland's part, we demand that the Scottish Government do their part. Stop setting targets without strategy that has led to a continual failing to meet said targets. There are so many people in Glasgow and in the rest of the country that COP26 will bypass, whom the delegates will not see but who are the very people we need to take on this journey. Where is the Scottish Government's consideration of their needs? Smoke and mirrors, presiding officer, that approach by this Scottish Government will no longer be tolerated, and I ask the Chamber to accept the amendment in the name of Liam Kerr, presiding officer. Thank you. I call on Lorna Slater to wind up. Can't believe up to that. nine minutes, Minister. I can't believe that. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to my parliamentary colleagues for their contributions. It always warms my green heart to hear so much passion for and commitment to caring for our planet and being good global citizens. I also welcome the world to Glasgow for the COP26 summit and note my thanks to those who have contributed to enabling this vital summit to take place. As noted in the parliamentary motion, Glasgow will be humanity's last opportunity to deliver on the ambitions set out in the Paris Climate Summit of 2015 and to limit climate change to within 1.5 degrees, beyond which the impacts for people, wildlife and our planet become intolerable. The climate crisis is intensifying with every day that passes. Across the world, we are now witnessing the impact, suffering and loss at a frequent and devastating scale around the world. This is no longer about targets, it's action we need. Act inaction is costing lives. Our response to this crisis, to this emergency, has to be, I'm gonna try and get through all the uh, debate responses, I won't take interventions. Um, our response to this crisis, to this emergency, has, been, has to be commensurate to the size, scale, and urgency of it. Today, I have heard many suggestions from across the chamber, all of which I will reflect on, on how we can do more. I look forward to this chamber's support as we strive to bring about the transformative action at the scale we know is needed. The Cabinet Secretary has already spoken to the progress Scotland is now making. I am proud to see green policies being taken forward in the programme for government and the cooperation agreement between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Greens. Warmer, efficient homes, free bus travel for young people, a massive increase in funding for cycling, walking and wheeling, record investments in marine renewables, plans to double the size of the onshore wind sector. These changes are a good start, but I also have no doubt that this is not enough. Monica Lennon is right to note in her amendment that the Scottish Government has not met its climate targets. It is right for us to show some humility here that we haven't been getting it completely right, that we haven't done enough. I welcome Monica Lennon's amendment to today's motion because it talks about modal shift in transportation, achieving Scotland's full potential in renewable energy and creating local green jobs. 
I am glad that we share a vision for investing in and growing domestic supply chains and securing a just transition that leaves no individual, family or community behind. The Scottish Greens will support Liam MacArthur's amendment, covering, as it does, an area of policy aviation that is excluded from the cooperation agreement with the Scottish Government. It is the Scottish Government's position that demand for aviation must decline in order to reach our climate targets. With respect to uh, Maurice Golden, the UK isn't credible on climate. The International Energy Agency says that ongoing oil and gas extraction isn't compatible with keeping global heating to 1.5 degrees. So while the UK doesn't commit to ending oil and gas extraction, it cannot be credible on climate. Alistair Allen and Jenny Minto, I'm going to, I'm going to go through with the other members. Uh, Alistair Allen and Jenny Minto are right to highlight the very real dangers of sea level rises in Scotland. The cost and damage of this is immense. And every time anyone asks who will pay for preventing climate change, I always think who will pay for the cost of not preventing it? Neil Bibby, I welcome his comments on public transport. It is indeed the key, along with an increase in active travel, to meet our target of 20% reduction in car miles. Co the cooperation... I've got to keep cracking through. The cooperation agreement provides funds for councils around Scotland to look at setting up their own bus services. Uh, Graham Simpson, it may come as a bit of a shock to him that councillors and, uh, from his party and some MSPs have been voting against cycle lanes being installed and campaigning to get them removed where they've been, where they've been built. No, I'm going to keep going. Uh, Katie Clark is right to highlight that the 1.5 degrees of warming isn't safe. It's pretty bad, and it, it, but it isn't quite the apocalyptic levels of disruption that we'll see at the three degrees of warming that Mark Ruskell described. Sarah Boyack's support for community and cooperative heat networks is very welcome, as is her recognition of the jobs that this decarbonisation of our heating will create. Brian Whittle uh, says that he's, I'm very happy to elaborate if he's not clear on what the reserved powers are to Westminster. Um, there's an excellent Wikipedia article on it if he's not. Um, it can both be clear that we can do more. We can do more in Scotland and that we could do even more if those powers were devolved. We have reached a critical moment in time. I sincerely hope that the UK government can lead these talks to a constructive and productive conclusion in a way that allows all governments to reconsider their priorities and secure our survival. I also call on world leaders to take immediate and rapid action on emissions reduction and investment in low emission and zero carbon technology on a global scale, lest the losses and impact of climate change intensify and become more destructive. As a global citizen and as highlighted by Fiona Hislop and Colette Stevenson, I am proud of the positive start we have made with Scotland's Climate Justice Fund, which will help those in the global south tackle the climate crisis. We recognize the loss and damage already occurring as a result of climate change and that those suffering most from these changes are those least responsible for it. Here at home, I look forward to the analysis that will be conducted of Scotland's North Sea oil and gas production with a view to assessing the compatibility of current and future field development with the parameters of the Paris Agreement. The impact of climate change will reach every area of our country and culture, and so we must act now and prepare ourselves and all aspects of our way of life, for otherwise the consequences of our inaction will be too awful to bear. Thank you to the members of the Chamber for today's debate and for all the points raised. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on global ambitions for COP26. Um, point of order, Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I seek your guidance. Uh, during the debate that we've just had, Sandesh Gulhani intervened on Liam Kerr um, and was then interrupted by the Deputy Presiding Officer, who told him to hurry up and ask a question. Mr Kerr was untroubled by the intervention, I have to say. It seemed perfectly normal to me. Can you advise if there is now a time limit on interventions and if they do indeed need to end in a question? It is, of course, a matter for the presiding officer in the chair at any point in time to make a ruling on any question that is put to them. I will certainly 
um, look at the matter that Mr Simpson has raised, but I have no doubt at all that my Deputy Presiding Officer will have handled it in a manner that they saw fit. Thank you. Um, it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is an urgent question. And I call Sue Webber. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the statement that NHS Lothian services are under extreme pressure and that patients should not attend the emergency department unless it is life-threatening. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. He's online today. Question. Our health and care system is under extreme pressure due to the pandemic and NHS Lothian like of course all health boards, is experiencing significant pressure, including workforce challenges, a high level of delayed discharge, which is inevitably affecting waiting times in the A&E. We recognise that some people aren't getting the service of care they, or indeed we would expect, and I apologise to anyone, of course, that has suffered as a result of that. It's our ambition to ensure that more patients receive person-centred care in the right place, in the right time, and in a way that helps staff deliver high-quality care in treatment. That is why we invested £23 million, uh, this year to support the development of the redesign of urgent care. I recently also announced a £300 million package of winter measures that includes a focus on bolstering the caring workforce by increasing the numbers and providing them with additional support. Uh, along with my senior officials, I have met with uh, the executive team at NHS Lothian uh, this morning, and we have agreed a set of immediate actions that will support improvements and minimise delay for pa delays for patients. Sue Weber. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The figures released yesterday confirmed that we have the worst A&E waiting times on record. And since the Cabinet Secretary's NHS recovery plan was published in August, more than 55,000 people have waited over four hours to be seen in A&E, and over 11,000 of those people have been from NHS Lothian. After the advice from NHS Lothian last night, there has rightly been a lot of concern from people about having to self-diagnose whether something is life-threatening or not. Some injuries are not life-threatening, but are serious. A broken ankle may not kill. A stroke left untreated can have life-changing consequences. Does the Cabinet Secretary now accept that the Government's recovery plan was not sufficient? And does he endorse this advice from NHS Lothian? And if so, how can people access treatment that they need? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Sue Weber for what uh, is an important question? I think all health boards, uh, all clinicians would say that if you think your uh, condition, of course, is critical or life-threatening, do not hesitate for a second. Call 999 or get yourself to your a &E, uh, department. But, of course, if you do not think it is critical or life-threatening, then there are other alternative pathways, such as calling NHS 24, for example. But, of course, people should uh, err on the side of caution if they feel their injury condition or that of a family member or friend uh, is critical or indeed uh, life-threatening. But it is important people listen to the advice uh, of, of clinicians of the health board, because I think all of us would accept, all of us would understand uh, that those that are working in our hospitals and right across our NHS only want the best for the people uh, that they treat. But this is a time of extreme pressure. And what I would say to Sue Weber is this government will continue to invest. Of course, we are facing the most significantly challenging winter the NHS has ever suffered. And this is going to be, of course, of cold comfort to people who are waiting in any departments. Uh, our performance is not where I'd want it to be. But it is, of course, or it is the case that our any departments are the best performing in the entire UK. And the reason I mention that, of course, uh, is because just to highlight that these are common challenges that are being faced right across the UK. So we'll continue to invest in my £300 million winter package that I announced. Uh, I know health boards are working around the clock to try to maximise capacity by safely discharging those who are clinically safe to discharge back into community settings. Sue Weber. Thank you. Uh, this morning, a constituent of mine got in touch with me by text. She was too scared and upset to go into work at the Royal Infirmary because she knew that people had been waiting for over 30 hours in A&E due to the lack of beds. And in the announcement, NHS Lothian Chief Executive Callum Campbell admitted that NHS Lothian hospitals are close to capacity and the hospital system is under extreme duress. NHS Lothian has asked for mutual aid 
to help ease the sustained pressures on, our, on their teams and their patients. Will the government provide this aid? And what message does the Cabinet Secretary have for hard-working NHS frontline staff who are having similar fears as that of my constituent? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first and foremost, can I thank Sue Weber's constituent for all that they have done uh, during the pandemic, but particularly at the moment during this uh, very significant period of challenge. I also spoke to uh, a clinician this morning uh, who works in one of the Edinburgh Hospital sites. And again, they reiterated how challenging and pressured the system is. I spoke to Callum uh, Campbell, as well as uh, the NHS chair of Loth NHS Lothian chair, John Conaghan, this morning, they have had really urgent and rapid discussions with the local authority partners, with the HSCPs in the region, uh, and they are making exceptionally good progress. Uh, they, they feel they can make exceptionally good progress in order to safely discharge those people who are clinically safe to discharge uh, from hospitals into community. And of course, the effect that will have is freeing up capacity, which will also help with flow within the hospital. And that is what the winter announcement package was there to help. And look, I, I won't uh, pretend otherwise, uh, even with that uh, increased investment, this will still be a very, very challenging winter ahead. Uh, performance will continue to be difficult. Uh, but certainly, of course, uh, where bo boards ask for aid um, uh, and, and that aid can be provided, uh, of course, we will leave no stone unturned in helping our health boards at this difficult time. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary asked people to think twice before calling an ambulance. Uh, now patients are being told in Lothian to hold off completely unless it's life threatening. This winter, the NHS is reaching the crux of years of under resourcing and mismanagement. It is in genuine jeopardy. Now, I personally don't have a medical degree, so I'd be grateful for some advice from the Cabinet Secretary. What exactly does life-threatening mean? And then will the Health Secretary accept that asking people to judge for themselves whether or not their condition is life-threatening will possibly prove deadly? Cabinet Secretary. As I've already said to Sue Weber, if people feel that their condition is critical or life-threatening, of course, uh, they should uh, pick up the phone call 999, uh, get an ambulance, or indeed if they are able to get someone to transport them to, the, to an A&E &E department, then get themselves to an A&E &E department. Uh, of course, there are other pathways available if you are not critical or life-threatening, and that would be, for example, to call NHS 24, uh, which is a 24-7 uh, helpline, of course, to be able to get uh, that assistance. But, uh, but every health board uh, in the country uh, certainly is under pressure. We know that, uh, and therefore, if we are able to assist uh, by using alternative pathways, if your condition is not critical or life-threatening, uh, then, of course, that is the advice that has been given uh, right across the board. Fiona Hislop. NHS Lothian made uh, absolutely absolutely clear in the most recent briefings to MSPs and the Lothians that one of the major pressures their hard-working staff are facing in the enduring pandemic, alongside high levels of staff illness and self-isolation, is the acute staff shortages in social care, which is impacting on the whole health and care system, uh, vacancies um, elsewhere and uh, shortage of EU workers. C can the Minister uh, state what the very recently produced adult social care winter plan can do to help these Pressures. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, Fiona Hislop for again what is an incredibly important question. Uh, again, the adult social care winter plan uh, plus the winter plan that was produced in relation to the, the £300 million winter package it really does focus on social care because we know if we can bolster the social care workforce, then we can help at both the front door and the back door of our acute services. We can prevent people from going to hospital, hopefully, if they have the care at home and care home packages that they need, but also, of course, we can help at the delayed discharge end by uh, safely discharging uh, people to community settings, again, where that is clinically safe to do so. So the £300 million I announced, uh, £48 million of that uh, is being made available to increase the hourly rate of social care staff. That will match NHS Band 2 staff. It will also help to recruit 1,000 uh, additional NHS staff to support uh, MDTs, multi multidisciplinary teams, um, and over 60 million uh, of that investment was to maximise capacity uh, at care home and care, uh, oh, sorry, of care at home uh, services. So um, there is a significant amount of investment going into this. Uh, of course, it will take some time to recruit the 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 the, the, the workforce uh, that I have mentioned. But I know every single health board is looking to do that as a matter of urgency and pace. Sarah Boyack. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, people urgently need frontline health support, and many are going to A&E because they or their family members are having a health crisis and they can't get the support locally. I've been inundated with patients in the Riverside Surgery area, Musselburgh, for example, who have got heartbreaking stories about not being able to access GP services, predating the pandemic, but the issue has been raised by other constituents across the region. So can the Cabinet Secretary say what he is doing now to ensure patients have the local medical services they need, as well as the support they need when they attempt to access accident emergency services. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Sarah Boyack for her question? I, I met uh, recently with Colin Beattie, MSP, who raised this issue with me around Riverside uh, Medical Practice, uh, and again have offered to continue the dialogue with him. And of course, I would offer extend that offer. Uh, to Sarah Boyack also uh, to see how we can assist uh, in that. Of course, it is for the local health board uh, to take forward uh, those issues. But in terms of uh, local services, I wrote jointly with the BMA uh, recently that every single GP practice in the country, including those, of course, in the Lothian Health Board uh, region, uh, where I laid out quite explicitly my expectation that given the changes in guidance, there would be an increase in face-to-face uh, -face GP appointments, which we know uh, may well help uh, in this regard. And can I thank GPs for the incredible hard work that they are doing at this time? Uh, and of course, when it comes to local, other local services, uh, again, the investments that I've already mentioned will help to bolster some of those local services and hopefully take that pressure off acute settings. Julian Mackay. Ms Mackay? has said that the board has... Sorry, do continue, Ms Mackay. We can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. NHS Lothian's Chief Executive has said that the Board has requested mutual aid, but I'm concerned about other health boards' capacity to fulfil this request. As we know, the issues facing NHS Lothian are impacting health boards across the country. And just a few days ago, NHS Lanarkshire moved to its highest risk level. What assurance can the Cabinet Secretary provide that requests for mutual aid can be met? and that health boards that are struggling will be provided with the assistance they need. Cabinet Secretary. So, Gillian McKay is, of course, absolutely correct. Every single health board area is uh, under pressure and under strain. Um, where they can request, uh, where they can get potentially mutual aid is, for example, uh, reaching out to the Golden Jubilee, um, uh, and, and they can help, for example, with planned care. Uh, and we know how important, of course, it is to try to address issues with planned care, particularly where there's been a postponement of, 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 of P2, P3, P4 uh, groups of, of, of surgery, because we know if those backlogs continue to increase, then, of course, we're just storing up problems uh, for the future. So it is for each health board to discuss with other health boards what mutual aid may well be available. Of course, where a request comes in for other support, such as military support, uh, then, then, then we, of course, will also give that uh, serious consideration and pass that on to, to, to the military and the armed forces where appropriate and necessary. Thank you. That concludes the urgent question. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 1797 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you very much, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak on the motion. The question is that motion 1797 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of four Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 1798 on Code of Conduct for Councillors, 1799 on Model Code of Conduct for Members of Devolved Public Bodies, 1800 on Approval of an SSI, and 1801 on Designation of a Lead Committee. And happy to move all of them. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 1769.4, in the name of Liam Kerr, which seeks to amend Motion 1769, in the name of Michael Matheson, on Global Ambitions for COP26, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.